Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Meriden Historical Society program on the Hanover Trolley Park, presented by Leslie Salkowski. Before we begin the program, a few pieces of information. All attendees joining us on Zoom are on mute, and we ask you that you please keep your microphones and cameras off to ensure an uninterrupted presentation. To turn your camera off, click the Stop Video button in the bottom left corner of your screen. After tonight's presentation, we will have a live question and answer session. Please submit your questions in the chat. You will find the chat icon in the Zoom toolbar on the bottom of your screen, and you will see the blinking icon now. For those watching live on Facebook, you can submit your questions too. Leave your questions in the comments section of the live stream, and we will do our best to ask as many of them at the end of the presentation. And now, to get us started, it is my honor to introduce Sherwin Borsuk, President of the Meriden Historical Society. Uh, welcome to the next in our series of programs about Meriden, brought to you by the Meriden Historical Society. Our speaker for tonight's program, entitled Hanover Trolley Park, will be Leslie Solkowski. The Meriden Historical Society is a 501c3 not-for-profit, and we depend to a great extent on contributions to pay our expenses. If you choose to contribute, you'll find a link in the chat or your confirmation email from earlier today to contribute on your Facebook screen or on our website, MeridanHistoricalSociety.org. I'd now like to introduce Justin Piccarillo, a board member of the Historical Society, and now a newly published author of his book, Hubbard Park, which is available on Amazon or at your favorite local bookstore. Thank you. Thank you, Sherwin. Good evening, everybody. My name is Justin Piccarillo from the Marin Historical Society. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our virtual program on Hanover Park. Next month marks the 126th anniversary of the park's opening day and what better way to commemorate that anniversary than with a program all about the park. It is my privilege to introduce our presenter, Leslie Solkowski. If you don't know her, Leslie is a past president of the Marin Historical Society and has been a society volunteer for many, many years. Her Meriden research and collecting interests focus on open salts and now Hanover Park. In her professional life, she was a pediatric nurse for 30 years at St. Francis Hospital. Tonight, Leslie and I will share a presentation about the history of Hanover Park, and we will host a question and answer session. Throughout and after the presentation, you can ask questions in the Zoom chat or the Facebook stream. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. And with that, welcome, Leslie. Oh, thank you, Justin. All right, let's go to the park. All right, Hanover Park in South Meriden was the place to be on summer evenings or weekends in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And this is a, a view of the entrance to the park that you would see as you arrived. And this is another view of the entrance to the park. So, Nestled between Hanover Ponds Eastern Shore and Hanover Avenue, it was one of the area's best amusement parks. People of all ages flocked to the park once it was opened on Memorial Day each year. The park opened in 1895 and continued as an amusement park until the 1930s. And this is a map of the park from 1921, just to orient everybody. This, this right here is Hanover Street coming down towards South Meriden where the, our research center is down here. The trolleys would come down here. They would enter this trolley loop, uh, drop their passengers off here and then complete the loop and head back to pick up more passengers. Uh, this, these streets up here, Bellevue Street, uh, Harrington and Parkview, one of these two, I'm not sure which is which. Um, this is the ballpark, which is still there today. And this itself right here is the park. Uh, we have the dance hall here, the casino. Down here is the, the carousel. The boat launch is down here and the roller skating rink is up here. This is the pond out here. We have another map I'll show later on. Prior to the park being built, land had been called the plains in the 1700s and later in the 1800s, the meadows. During the civil war, it was called Camp Tyler when a, bat a battalion of artillery and cavalry was stationed there. 
It took eight months and $30,000 to transform the, transform the land, which was farmland and thick brush into the lakefront park with manicured lawns and beautiful flower beds. The park was privately financed and owned by investors from Philadelphia. No taxes were used to pay for the park. This is uh, the casino here that you can see. This is the carousel over here. And right over here, you can see the, the end of the trolley loop with the, the trolley tracks here. Opening day under a new management was advertised for May 30th, 1895. 10,000 people attended on opening day. Activities included a new switchback railroad, which was an old fashioned term for a roller coaster, two balloon ascensions, several bands, dancing, ball games, boat rides, and a giant fireworks display at the end of the day. Hanover Park was owned and operated by the Connecticut Company, which utilized trolleys before converting to buses. Trolley lines provided intra-city transportation, as well as connections to outlying areas such as Southington, Wallingford, Middletown, and even as far as Savin Rock and Lake Compounds. Riding the trolleys was a great weekend diversion. Transfers could be made to various shore points like Mamogwin or Savin Rock. Another popular ride was to Milldale and Plainville and back again. And this shows a trolley on the corner of um, Colony Street, and this is West Main. And in the late 1800s and early 1900s, people depended on trolleys to get to school or work. In order to entice people to use the trolleys during the evenings and on weekends, when usage of the trolley was light, the trolley companies built parks. Trolley parks were amusement parks with rides, entertainment, and picnic areas. It was a perfect answer for the trolley company's low ridership period. The parks provided a destination for young and old alike for their leisure time. Trolleys were originally horse-drawn cars that ran on steel tracks like train tracks down the center of Main Street. But shortly after the park's opening, the company switched to electric cars. Um, this is one of the horse tracks, uh, horse carts. So, okay. The cars were open air. The seats were placed side to side in the cars with no aisle. So to get from one seat to the other, you would need to use the running board on the outside of the trolley. If the trolley was overcrowded, people used to stand along the running board holding on tight. And this uh, was a photo that was on posted on Facebook uh, by Mr. Peter Finch, who gave us permission to use it. Uh, it's the uh, Main Street trolley. And these are Wilcox and White girls. Uh, you can see the conductor here, the motor man is up here. And one of these ladies, I'm not sure which one is his relative. So. Okay, this made it hard for the conductor who had to walk along the running board to collect the fares. If there were people riding there, he had to squeeze around them while the trolley was clanging along. Passengers needed to buy tokens and those were collected by the conductor. And this is a, a photo of an actual token bank uh, that was used on the Meriden trolleys. Getting to Hanover Park was part of the fun. One needed to catch one of the trolleys that serviced the city. From the South Broad Street area, you could catch the trolley near Ann Street, ride along Curtis Street, and then endure a breathtaking ride down the East Main Street Hill to Pratt Street. And this is the uh, Broad and Curtis Street. And this one, you can actually see the horse there. This is the horse trolley again. There you would change to the Hanover Park trolley, which you take, take you down Hanover Avenue to the park. And this is the, one of the park um, Pratt and Hanover Street uh, trolleys. And another view of a different one. Okay. The trolley would pull into a circle near the ball field, unload its passengers, then complete the circle back out onto the regular track for a trip back to town for another load of park goers. So they would come down Hanover and go into the park here. This is the back of the grandstand of the ballpark. And then they would come out and come back up to Miss West Main Street. There could be as many as 10 to 15 trolleys in the circle at the same time. Hanover Park advertised, advertised itself as the most desirable park in New England for picnics or Sunday school excursions. 
It also catered to large groups of fraternal organizations or industries for their outings. The superintendent advertised that persons of a disorderly character are not seen in the park. No fakirs or vendors of any sort were allowed. Since Hanover Park was a destination for all of Central Connecticut, not just Meriden, people coming, coming from Cheshire Waterbury area would take the Meriden Waterbury trolley and get off on the west side of the pond where the walking trail is now. They would then cross a short bridge to a peninsula in the middle of the pond, which is not there now, and enter the park through the back door. And to, or again, to orient you, this, the train would come from Cheshire and Waterbury up this way, They'd drop people off here, again, where the um, trail is now. They crossed a short footbridge onto the island in the park and then cross the peninsula and then come into the park uh, through the back door. And this is, this is hard to see, but this is a little footbridge here that goes out to the island uh, across. The park itself was 30 acres of spacious, well-manicured lawns, beautiful flower beds, crushed stone paths, and shady groves with benches and picnic areas. Families would arrive on Sundays with large picnic baskets. Sunday school outings were held here. Entrance to the park was free if you arrived by trolley. Scattered throughout the park were buildings for refreshments, hamburgers, hot dogs with sauerkraut, candy apples, cotton candy, soda, and beer. In the summer, crowds of bathers, boaters, strollers, cyclists, and picnickers thronged the park from sunup to sundown. One of the most popular events at Hanover Park was the balloon ascensions, which took place several times a week, usually at three in the afternoon. Uh, and this is an, um, we don't have any actual pictures of the balloon itself, but this was an artist uh, drawing one. And actually the balloon is up here. Uh, this is the parachute and we'll talk about that in a minute. And this is another picture we found. This is the balloon itself. Here's the person uh, controlling it and here's the parachute. Balloons in those days were not the colorful ones that you see floating by today. They were all black and more importantly, they did not carry any way to heat the air to make the balloon float. Instead, the balloon was placed over a round brick collar. A fire was then started in an underground furnace and the smoke and heated air were funneled into the balloon. As the balloon inflated, several volunteers from the crowd were needed to hold it down until it was completely inflated. Then the balloonist wearing a white suit jumped on a small platform and shouted, let it go. The men would instantly release the balloons, they were hold, the ropes they were holding. If anyone held on too long, he would be in danger of being lifted aloft. Off the balloon would go to the crowd's delight. As soon as the balloon was launched, the balloonist's assistant would take off with a horse and wagon to follow the balloon to bring it back. Once the balloon was airborne, the air inside the balloon would start to pool. When that happened, the balloon would plunge to earth. The balloonist had to judge very carefully when that would happen and cut himself loose just before and parachute to earth. The Meriden record would always publish the condition of the balloon and the balloonist the next day in the paper. Mary Sadler McGuire was a young woman from Meriden who made her first balloon ride on a dare. She liked it so much that without her parents knowing, she started taking lessons from Dan Barnell, who lived in New Britain and was one of the most popular balloonists of the day. She then started working for him under her stage name, Aretta Barnell, doing trapeze tricks on the ascensions. She would wear a pink blouse, tan knickers, and knee-high boots and pink carnations in her hair. She would hang by her knees from the trapeze, trapeze rings until it was time to cut loose. She performed not only in Meriden, but went to California where she was also a big hit. During her, her career, she um, suffered some cuts and bruises, but was never seriously hurt. In 1900, it was reported in the paper that the superintendent did not think balloon ascensions were as interesting as they had been in the past and would probably be offered less. And this is again, another picture of a artist's picture of a balloon. He's actually a balloon here and he's parachuting down. And this is a, an advertising uh, with Oretta Barnell, uh, an ascension with Oretta Barnell. Okay, the ballpark opened on April 18, 1894, 
and is one part of the park which is still in existence. It was a large field complete with a grandstand and bleachers holding up to 600 to 800 people. In its day, it was the site of games from the industrial league amateur teams and also some semi-pro teams. Meriden had one called the Meriden Resolutes. And this is one view of the um, ballpark. Yeah, and another of uh, the bleachers and one more of an actual ball game being played. It was the home, um, home field for the Meriden Police Department. The annual game between the Meriden Police and the New Britain Police was always played there, with the profits from the game being used to fund the police retirement fund. And this is the 1929 uh, police baseball team. Bonnie Mack, who went on to Major League Baseball as a player and manager, was a catcher for one season at the park. Frank Grant, an African-American, played at the park for a season before joining the International League. He went on to be inducted into the Negro Baseball Hall of Fame in Kansas City and the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. The park was also used by the school department. The high school did not have a baseball or football field, so all the practices and games were played at Hanover Park. Players went from the high school on Pleasant Street to the park for practices. Elementary schools did not have gyms. The students did daily calisthenics exercises standing by their desks in the classroom with the windows wide open. Calisthenics consisted of bending and squatting, arm and leg extensions, and rotating necks. Once a year, all the Meriden schools had a field day competition at the ball field. Over 2,000 children from grades three to eight would be on the field demonstrating their calisthenics. Parents would watch as their children demonstrated gymnastics or ran races. Girls wore white dresses and boys wore white shirts with dark knickers. They also wore a red or blue crepe paper ribbon over their shoulder and across their chests. This worked well until one day there was a sudden shower resulting in their right clothes being stained red or blue. And this is a program that was recently donated um, to the Society of a School Field Day in 1923. The ball field was used for other purposes. During World War I, the field was used as a high school military unit to parade and perform maneuvers and drills. William Jennings Bryan, who was a Democratic nominee for president four times, held a political rally in the park on June 16, 1902. This is one of his cards and again, his, his slogan. The park was the scene of many boxing matches. Meriden's own featherweight champion, Louis Kid Kaplan, started here. This is another featherweight champion from Meriden, Charlie Pilkington, the Meriden Flash, also had several matches in the park. One, one fight between rivals Kid Kaplan and Johnny Chagru of Waterbury at the beginning of their careers was particularly memorable. Huge cries or crowds arrived from Waterbury and were matched in numbers by Meriden fans. Large amounts of money was bet on the match. A ring was set up in the middle of the ball field. The fight was evenly matched until the eighth round when Kid Kaplan had Chagru shook up and on the ropes a couple of times. In the ninth round, Kaplan really had control and Chagru started weakening. Suddenly, without warning, all the lights in the park went out and pandemonium broke out. No one ever figured out what happened with the water with the lights. The Meriden fans always accused the Waterbury crowd of being responsible because their man was losing. A lot of money was at stake and needed to be protected. Eventually, Captain, uh, Kaplan was declared the winner and went on to become the, fe well, the featherweight champ. Okay. The main building was called the casino, which had an excellent floor for dancing and could hold up to 50 couples. The building itself was two stories high with space over the dance floor extending up to the ceiling. There was a wide veranda around the outside of the building which served as a promenade for couples between dances or as a shelter from sudden rainstorms. The dances were held almost every night, often featuring big name bands. Breezes from the lake made it one of the coolest places in the summer. Band concerts were held in the casino or on the pavilion overlooking the lake 
and sometimes in a launch out on the water with the music floating gently over the water. In 1922, a proposal to license dancing on Sunday evenings was opposed by the Ministers Association, the WCTU and the YMCA. The theater at Hammer Park was the site of shows of all sorts, plays, picture shows, vaudeville, minstrel shows and concerts. An announcement in the morning record on May 14, 1901, reported that the theater at Hanover Park was ready to open on May 27th, and that the seating capacity had been greatly increased. The old hard wooden benches had been replaced by 700 opera chairs that the management had bought from an old theater in New York City. Many were plush seats and were a great improvement over the benches. And this is an ad for um, some of the things that were going to be happening at the park. Actors from the theater stayed at the Lawn Hotel, which is now a private residence on Hanover Road. And this was the uh, Lawn Hotel as it looked at that time. And this is the hotel as it is today. Okay, 36 rowboats were available for rent for rides around the pond or up past Red Bridge. Or for 10 cents, you could take a ride on a naphtha operated boat around the pond and up the Quinnipiac River. So many kids fell off the boat that it became the custom for kids to wear swimsuits and dive off the boat. This is, this is the naphtha boat right here. Okay, and, and this is the naphtha boat again. This is the Meriden Cutlery Country and the cut, Cutlery Company in the background here. All sorts of rides were available in the park. The flying horses or carousel or airplane rides, the Ferris wheel. One of the favorites was the roller coaster, first called a switchback. The switchback on Cody Island was the first roller coaster designed as an amusement park and was constructed in 1884. The one here in Meriden worked on the same principle. The car went from a tall tower by gravity down the track and then up to another tower where it was switched to another track for the return trip. On May 1st, 1900, the north end of the switchback caught fire. The Doolittle Truck Company sent two people with chemical extinguishers to put out the fire, which resulted in a $200 damage. And this is the um, tower here. And oh, back up, sorry, <laughs> tower. And it would, uh, you, you'd roll, go down the roller coaster by gravity up to this tower. They'd switch the track and then you'd go back again. Okay, and this is an actual picture of the tower. You can see the track over here and the other tower over here. Okay, and this is an actual picture of um, some people on the, on the uh, roller coaster. Uh, we were just looking the other day and there are two policemen here. We aren't quite sure why they're there, but they're two policemen. And it's interesting that all of them are men and they were wearing a hat so they couldn't have been going very fast. The carousel was an enclosed octagonal building. At first, the animals were stationary, but soon they were replaced by ones that galloped. There were horses, lions, tigers, camels, giraffe, and deer, and zebras, and sleighs and swan boats for the ones that were too young to ride on the animals. Older boys tried to reach out and grab the brass ring as they rode by. The prize for catching the ring was a free ride. And this is another view of the carousel. The casino and carousel were steam heated uh, in the winter so it could be operated year round. During the winter, the pond was also a popular place for ice skating. The park hosted special events on occasion. One was the annual Darktown Day. On August 9th, 1906, the paper reported that over a thousand African-Americans from all over the state attended. Participants were served a fine dinner. Roller skating, a show at the theater, and a baseball game were planned. And this photo shows the uh, African-Americans from the Emanuel Baptist Church in New Haven arriving uh, at the train station and then by trolley. 
Another event was the annual baby show. On one occasion, over 300 mothers with their babies arrived at the park for all kinds of contests. 17 silver cups were the prizes for the winners in the categories. Fat babies, thin babies, twins, triplets, colored, handsomest, et cetera. There was also a doll exhibit that day and a children's art contest and Japanese fireworks. The park was also used for manufacturers exhibitions. And this is a uh, program with a diagram uh, for booth locations for the manufacturers and varied arts exhibition held in June of 1906. Okay, and here is another event from 1895, the year that the park opened, the greatest barbecue sponsored by the American Retail Butchers Association. And they had all kinds of rides. They had the ham race, a tub race, grease pole climbing, a pudding race, a bag race, and a greased pig. Children's or Juvenile Day was also held annually. Every child aged five to 15 who paid their nickel trolley fare received a souvenir. Balls, bats, neck chains, purses, knives, work baskets, Japanese parasols were given out. One lucky person received a free gold watch if he had the winning ticket, which was announced at the theater during the afternoon show. And these are some of the souvenirs from Hanover Park, um, salt and pepper shakers and uh, a plate, uh, both, both showing scenes of the uh, Casino. And this is a letter opener from Hanover Park. Okay, a day at the park usually ended with a fireworks show. People watched from the lawns or the veranda of the casino. After the fireworks, there would be a great stampede to board the trolleys to ride happily home. In 1920s, the interest in the park declined. Trolleys gave way to buses and autos. People could travel farther to Savin Rock or Lake Compounds more easily. Even though the park was less popular, there was still dancing in the evenings and ball games. One former Meriden residence remembered it as a sad place where hobos could shower and camp while passing through Meriden. After the park closed in the 1930s, the area became the parking area for Connecticut company buses. An article in, in the paper in November uh, 1942 reported that um, the last of the old landmarks, the pavilion, the bandstand, and five concession booths were being torn down. In 1952, the park was sold to the American Legion number 45. The ballpark, renamed Legion Park, is still in use today and is the only reminder of the halcyon days of Hanover Park. Thank you very much, Leslie. Thank you so much for your presentation. Now it's time for some questions. I have a few questions that I will ask Leslie to get us started and then we'll take questions from the audience. To ask a question, please send it in the Zoom chat or if you're watching on Facebook, please post it in the comments. We've already received a bunch of questions and I'm sure there'll be much more. We will do our best to get to as many as possible. Leslie, that was awesome. I waited so long to see that and I'm so happy. How you feeling? <laughs> Oh my God, that was awesome. Thank you. All right, first question right off the bat. Um, where did the interest for Hanover Park come from? Well, the society was asked by the um, Christmas in the Village Committee to develop um, some PowerPoint presentations to show at the um, Christmas in the Village um, in December of one year. And they gave us a list of um, suggestions and this seemed to be the most interesting to me. So that's the one I chose. Oh, it was, it was great. It was great. Um, I'm going to bounce around because there's a bunch over here on this screen and I have a bunch of questions here for you. So I'm going to bounce around a little bit and I hope you don't mind. Um, but one that seems to come up a couple of times here is uh, the casino hosted dinner and dances. Correct. Right. Uh, yeah, I, uh, it was dances. I only, I didn't see dinners, but, but it did talk about dinners being there and that would be the biggest building. So I'm assuming that the dinners were there. So the big question is, the word casino though, we know it as a different term today. Was right. there gambling or what? I don't, was, what I don't think that there was gambling there. Um, if, if the WCTU and the Minister's Association didn't want dancing on Sundays, they probably didn't want gambling either. <laughs> um, I did look that up and there is an uh, archaic 
definition of casino, which is a, is a place for uh, music and dancing. All so. right. All right. All right. Yeah, that we actually that's popped up a few times. So that's a, that's I'm glad we addressed that. Um, one question was, were, were there additional entrance fees for the rides for um, were there additional entrance? Fees? In the beginning, you mentioned a nickel got you into the park, got you into the park. Yeah, obviously, where the refreshments were, I'm sure that they had to pay for the refreshments. Okay. Um, you know, the first the you know, the hot dog stands and hamburger stands, things like that. Um, and on the on the barbecue um, poster that we saw, there was a charge for 25 cents to, to go to the barbecue. So I think that there were probably other charges. I'm not sure if they charged for the individual rides um, or if that was part of the entrance fee. Right. I don't know that. That was a cool nap, The nap the boat ride was um, a 10 cents fee. Okay. And I think it said you could rent boats. So I think that there was a charge. And they hosted fireworks each night. I mean, that that's got to be kind of costly as well. So I mean, they must have been making quite a quite a profit there. I would think so. You would think so. You hope I mean, so. It, it, to have ten thousand people in the park in one day is imagine that. a lot of people. <laughs> imagine that. Um, you mentioned a naphtha boat. What yes. in, what in the world is a naphtha boat? Um, naphtha is the type of fuel that's used. And it's similar to lighter fluid today. Uh, it, and it's very, very flammable, so. Were there any accidents in, in regard? Of I haven't found any. I would think that it was a good possibility there may have been, but I haven't found uh, documentation of any. Okay. Um, and so in the pictures that I've seen and the postcards I have and the postcards that you presented, um, you see the, the the lake is is just filled of people on boats and, you know, enjoying themselves, but you don't see swimming. Was there swimming or where was the beach if there was, or where was the uh, the front for it? Well, it, it did say bathers. Um, I don't know if there was a beach or if they just swam near the boat launch. I don't know that. Uh, it said the kids dove off the uh, naphtha boat. So they probably swam to shore from there. Right. So, um, but I don't know that there was a beach. I don't know that. Right, right. Um, another question that came in was about the dam. Now I know that the cutlery company put the dam in well before the park, but my question is, can you talk a little bit about Hanover Park and that dam? I mean, were these boats, you know, you know, was there a marker? Was there a barrier? Were there, um, you don't want to see one of these boats going down the dam. No, no. <laughs> and I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> that, that was the question that came up was, was about the dam. Um, how about, okay, take us again through um, this. So they came in on the train yeah. on the other side and then they walked over a footbridge. Can you talk a little bit about a footbridge and can you talk about um, the island and where is it today? Well, um, it's not there today. <laughs> um, and I'm not really sure what happened to it. Um, I asked Alan, our curator yesterday and he said, well, there was a lot of dredging in there. Um, and so maybe it was just eliminated, dredged away. I don't know. So the other thing he did tell me is that the um, Schutzen Club used to shoot skeet from the island. So really? Yeah. Well, I didn't know that. Okay. Um, concerning the other side, so the, the Oregon um, Road, um, that, that, um, what is it? The, the the Quinnipiac water the that one building that that um the Quinnipiac building across across mm -hmm. the river does that have any play in the park? I mean, is does that play anything? Is was that actually maybe possibly the uh, you know grabbing a ticket there? I mean, does that have any play in the park? Um, I don't know that. I I never found anything about that. No. That's all right, so here's a fun one. So let's go back 120 years and you're at the park. You can go to any ride you want or you can go to any spot in this park. Where are you gonna go? Well, um, the carousel would be first, uh, the theater would be second and just riding on the trolley would be third. <laughs> uh, that would be great. I know I'd, I'd love to go to the baseball game. I mean, just to see that field like that. 
And so the, so the field is the only structure that's left, correct? Right. And everything, um, it, it, I know there were some markers for Camp Tyler. Um, do you know anything about that as well? I don't. <laughs> yeah, you know, I knew that was a, I know they disappeared. When they dredged, I know something happened to that, yeah. so. I think that there's one marker there, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah, me neither, me neither. I'd love to go back there. Let's look at the um, the questions here. We got a few of them here. How many people could ride on one trolley car at a time? Um, I don't know that, but I would imagine four or five people across and um, people hanging on the uh, on the running boards. Just a minute, we're getting a count here of how many rows there were. There are at least there are at least six rows. You could say like maybe three across. I would say probably yeah. at least 20. maybe maybe six rows in the trolley and maybe um, three or four people across so, and then people uh, hanging on to the sides. So at least 20. so you would imagine with ten thousand people coming in a day. I mean that's a lot of trolley rides coming in. That is. That's a lot, and then going away too. I mean that's right. that's it's perpetual going 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 um do we know what happened to the carousel once it was the dismantled that's a great question no i don't i've never seen anything about that yeah that would be uh that would I, be, i'd, like to, know, I'd yeah. like to know that too we'll have to uh, dig a little deeper great question whoever said that great question um we get a few more here um, can you talk a little bit more why the park closed? I mean, it seems like, uh, um, you know, it, it didn't just like abruptly stop. It was almost like, I know my grandmother, and I told you this story, my, my grandmother used to go there when she was a kid, and it didn't abruptly stop. It was almost like it faded away in popularity. So can you talk a little bit about, um, about that? Well, I, it's just speculation, but um, people, people, started having cars more they could go further they could go to other places um they didn't have to rely on the trolleys to uh, bring them to the park for the day uh i don't i don't really know exactly why maybe interests changed i don't know that yeah no th I, that makes sense um what came of the trolley line somebody would like to know you mean the tracks itself? I or? guess so. It says just what came of the trolley line. So I'm assuming that uh, they're curious about, um, you know, perhaps maybe some of the trolleys were were salvaged. Were were. I don't. I don't know. I, I a lot of times the tracks are still there. Yeah. When they resurface roads, they find tracks, you know, underneath sure. the surface. Right. Um, I don't know what they came with the cars. Uh, they eventually just switched over to buses. Um, so I don't know what happened to the trolley cars. Here's an interesting one. They're asking about the balloon ascensions. Mm -hmm. How high did these ascensions actually go? Especially for the young lady from, from Meriden, if she's going to do all these tricks midair, how high were they really? The only, the only um, indication of how high things got is the, is the accident that Dan Barnell had, who was her instructor. Right. And it said when he was 100 feet in the air, his, his balloon burst into flame. Wow. So he was up at least 100 feet. I don't know if he was going up or <laughs> what. He came yeah. down pretty quick, I'm sure. He came down fast, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, here's a great comment from Elizabeth James. Uh, my dad is president of the Quinnipiac River Watershed Association. We have a lot of old photos to show. So if we want to go see some old photos of... Uh, in that our would park, be wonderful. That would be awesome. I'm, I'm coming with you because I want to learn a little bit more. Yeah. Um, We'd love to have copies here for our files too. That was one of the things I was going to say. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people out there have um, parents and grandparents who told stories about the park. Yeah. And if they could just share them with us and send us an email... Uh, even a few lines would be wonderful. We could add it to our files, right. but, and especially photos. I would love to see a photo of the um, the inside of the carousel. We don't have any photos of that. We don't have any photos of the actual balloon ascension. So I'd love to see those photos too. 
And what, what, what year are we looking at the balloon ascension? I mean, did that carry on through the, the longevity of the, of the park or was that? No, they really stopped after 1900 when the superintendent decided that people weren't interested in them anymore. Right. So. Um, you mentioned uh, briefly that there was an investor from Pennsylvania. Um, so how did that work? So, so you said there were no taxes taken from Meriden. Um, no, it, it was a private, it was all privately funded by the trolley company. And I guess it was owned by a, a group of people from Philadelphia. After they got rid of it, do you know where it ended up after that? Well, it, um, it became the Connecticut company. Okay. And then, um, in what the company you mean or the or the yeah you know, i don't know did the investor have it until its demise in the end or or did he sell it off to another i don't know off? um i don't know that uh i don't i didn't see any documentation of that yeah but it was sold to then to the american legion right right in 52 i think 51 52 one. yeah All right um we got a few more here um was dawson beach there at one time or was that after Hanover Park was torn down? So maybe you might want to I, talk about. I don't know Dawson Beach. I mean, I don't know when it was uh, in existence. Right. That, I think does that, somebody else in the audience know? I don't know that. I think um, that kind of goes along with what Alan was saying about when they dredged it, and um, you know, that's pretty mm -hmm. much when it disappeared. Um, another uh, a comment for Leslie. I loved your presentation. I had no idea that Hanover Park existed and to learn it was such a large and active venue. Thank you so very much, Leslie. So you are, look at Thank you, you, look at you. <laughs> um, I didn't write that. <laughs> no, 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 they're coming in as we speak. Uh, uh, yay, Leslie, well, great info. I definitely enjoyed the presentations. We got a lot, a lot of positive response on this. Um, so are there anything that you would like to, uh, to, to close with? Um, are there any? Um... Well, just um, to ask people for um, whatever stories they have about the park. As I said, we'd love to have them for the file. If they have pictures, if we could copy them and have them for our file, that would be great. Come uh, to the research center. Yeah, we could. Um, yeah, if they could come to the research center, we would copy them and give them back. We wouldn't keep them. So right. that's it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Leslie, for sharing your research and knowledge with us tonight. Okay. It was great to have you um, in your virtual program. Thank okay. you all for joining us tonight. Yeah. Before we end the program, we do have a few closing remarks. Can I just say one more thing? Oh, yeah, of course. I just would like to thank Ruth and Brian and Justin for all the many hours they spent uh, helping me get this program ready to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And back to you, Mr. Co Francisco. Okay, thank you so much to Leslie Salkowski for tonight's presentation and to Justin Piccarillo for moderating. I hope you enjoyed and hopefully learned something new about our community here in Meriden. If you enjoyed the presentation, you might also enjoy this upcoming community event. Our partners at the Department of Parks and Recreation asked us to let you know about a free bird watching event this Saturday, April 17th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. right at Hanover Pond. The event is being hosted by the Meriden Natural Resources Inventory Team and you can join the NRI team uh, in a socially distanced study of the area that once was Hanover Park. And you can take in the variety of birds that inhabit the landscape today, everything from buffleheads to bald eagles. And for more information, you can find the NRI page on Facebook. The Meriden Historical Society has two exciting programs coming up next month. Our biannual exhibits at the Andrews Homestead are back, and we invite you to view Vice in Meriden, Meriden Items for Bad Habits. This free exhibit is open to the public every Sunday in May from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Appropriate safety precautions will be in force, including mask wearing and social distancing. On May 20th, we invite you to join us for our next virtual program, The Faces of Hubbard Park, presented by Justin Piccarillo. Justin will share the stories of the people who made the celebrated masterpiece a local landmark and talk about his new book, Hubbard Park. To learn more about the Meriden Historical Society, you can visit MeridanHistoricalSociety.org and like us on Facebook. 
You can also find more information about our upcoming programs in both places, as well as a recording of tonight's program in the coming days. The Meriden Historical Society's Research Center is currently open by appointment only. If you'd like to make an appointment to do research, you can contact us at Meriden Historical Society at gmail.com. To support the Meriden Historical Society and our mission, you can donate to the Society on our website and even purchase an annual membership, both via PayPal. Community support and memberships are what enable us to steward the rich and diverse history of Meriden, Connecticut and its people. I hope you will consider making a donation if you enjoyed tonight's program. With that, thank you all for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed Hanover Trolley Park, and we hope to see you again soon.